Well, we're finally on tier 3. Took me long enough, I know. One of my more recent videos took me a while to work on because it was practically movie length. If you guys haven't seen it yet, I definitely recommend it. It's about a very interesting trilogy of science fiction dinosaur books. If you guys like the weird stuff that I cover on this iceberg series, I'm pretty sure you guys will like that video too. Anyways, I won't keep you guys waiting for too long since I'm sure you guys have been waiting for this video for a while. But you know what I love more than YouTube videos? Knowledge. Would you like to obtain some knowledge? There are plenty of places to get it, but there are a few that make the experience at best tolerable. That's where Brilliant comes in, who was nice enough to sponsor today's video. Brilliant is an online learning program that guides you through various STEM-based courses like math, science, and computer science. I can't say my brain will ever be fixed from the fateful events that occurred that day, but I will say that Brilliant did a brilliant job in repairing what they could of it. Yes, I just made that joke. What's great about this program is that it offers a fun and hands-on experience for you and guides you through these several courses. And speaking of which, there are over 60 available courses on Brilliant right now. One of the courses I've been taking recently is Logic, and this actually presents a pretty good example as to what Brilliant as a whole offers you. The whole point of this program is to help you enhance your problem-solving skills that may come in handy later in life, especially if you're someone interested in STEM-related classes. This is a great interactive tool that you should definitely take advantage of. So, if you're someone who's more about that online schooling life and are trying to learn more things like algorithms, statistics, geometry, and algebra, along with many other classes offered, then you're in luck. Brilliant has a deal going on right now giving the first 200 people that click on my link at the top of the description below 20% off their first annual membership. Once again, the first 200 people that click that top link gets 20% off an annual membership. So apply now today. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Let's get into part 1 of the third tier of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. Dragons are genetic memory of dinosaurs. This was an idea brought up by American astronomer and author Carl Sagan to give a somewhat logical answer, or I guess his version of a logical answer, as to why dragons are present and referenced across multiple cultures and religions. Carl Sagan himself was not a religious person, but he didn't consider himself to be an atheist either, since he states he didn't have the evidence to necessarily disprove the existence of God, nor did he see any evidence that proved proves there is one either. That being said, he would introduce this very interesting idea in a book that he wrote in 1977 called The Dragons of Eden. Now there really isn't anyone out there that seems to hardcore advocate for the existence of dragons, at least not that I've seen, and they're generally seen as creatures of myths and legends. Yet they're seen represented in so many different cultures and religions that it brings up the question as to why. Well in his book, Sagan suggests that the reason why this is is due to the fact that our very early mammalian ancestors were the ones being hunted and preyed on by dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles that had been dominating the food chain at that point. And those times of struggle had essentially burned this fear of dinosaurs and reptilian animals into the memories of our ancestors, which would then be passed on genetically all the way down to us modern humans, to which we now subconsciously represent them in our cultures and religions in the form of dragons. Because apparently, the dragons are supposed to represent some kind of leftover memory we have of dinosaurs, since the memory of them would most likely change with within a span of 66 million years. In my opinion, a very cool idea if it was maybe expressed in a more science fiction way. But it's definitely a hard one to wrap my head around. But at the end of the day, I don't know a lot about the concept of genetic memory, so I can't really say much on the matter. 36,000 Year Cycle during the Classical period, the concept of the Great Year was established in a creed made by the Greeks, who believed the Great Year to be a period in time that would result in some kind of planetary alignment within our solar system and cause a series of events to happen, both good and bad. Some of these conjunctions included natural disasters, but also religious events. 
Plato would later approach this concept with his own statement, saying that all planets and stars will align in the exact position they are currently in now after going through a 36,000 year cycle. Technically, it was a 72,000 year cycle because the first 36,000 years would be considered the golden years, which would then alternate to the next 36,000 years, which would consist of destruction and chaos. This would lead to a number of theories and people giving their own thoughts and ideas in regards to a cyclic time frame, one of which was James Usher, who instead gave an actual creation date of Earth's history that he considered to be biblically accurate. The time that he selected was 4004 BC, which is a date that young Earth creationists absolutely love, because if this was true, that means the Earth is between 5 to 6,000 years old. Obviously, this isn't the case, and the discussion of Earth's timeline, whether it be cyclic or linear, would continue. Nowadays, the ideas of the Great Year Cycle and the 4004 BC creation date are considered obsolete. Captain Beauclerk's Prehistoric Horse Haunting Alright people, things are about to get spooky. Let's set the scene. Retired Captain Beauclerk of the British 10th Regiment of Foot had been invited to the estate of his former commanding officer, Colonel Onslow, for a simple visit. A way for two old friends to reunite and reminisce about the times in the wars they fought together. What was planned to be a nice trip to the East Over Hall in Chiltern Hills, northwest of London, would turn out to be an extremely frightening experience for Beauclerk. Eastover Hall holds a massive piece of land, even overtaking an area containing a cave where fossilized remains of a prehistoric horse were discovered, according to Onslow. He also states that the manor itself is very haunted. During this visit, the two explored the land on horseback. As day began to turn to night, the two friends decided to make their way back home, and as they did, they encountered something very strange. A very large, white, and luminous horse. This would be considered the prehistoric ghost horse, which would then begin to chase them through the property. An excerpt of a document that recorded this event states, Although the night was dark, a strong lurid glow which seemed to emanate from all over enabled me to see distinctly its broad muscular breast, its panting steaming flanks, its long graceful legs with their hairy fetlocks and shoeless shining hooves. You know, this is starting to sound less like a horror story and more like a fan fiction. Anyways, it's powerful but arched back, its lofty colossal head with waving forelock, and broad massive forehead, its snorting nostrils, its distended foaming jaws, its huge glistening teeth, and its lips wreathed in a savage grin. According to Beauclerk's account on the events of that evening, the ghost horse bit down on him and pulled him off of his horse, where he then crashed to the ground, knocking him out. When he awoke, he was back at Onslow's house. Both he and the colonel were injured but alive, and the ghost horse was nowhere to be seen. Beauclerk would then suggest to Onslow to put the horse fossils back in the cave where he found them, believing that disturbing the prehistoric horse's final resting place was the reason for the encounter that had occurred that night. Onslow does exactly that, and the ghost horse was never seen again. Evolutionary Theory in Islam This is talking about just the general Islamic ideas and views when it comes to the theory of evolution. I'm assuming it's getting its own entry here because of how interesting and even wide range some of these ideas are. Of course, you have some of the more traditional beliefs. Some people believe that humans evolved over time, while others believed we always existed in this present form. Some follow the Quran, which has its own Adam and Eve story where the first man and woman were created with fluid and clay. Then there are some of the more interesting views, like Old Earth Creationism, which refers to the six-day creation period mentioned in the Book of Genesis. There were apparently six 24-hour days but some interpret this time frame to be unspecified, and some try to fit it in to accurately align with scientific studies, while others say the days consisted of indefinite gaps of time between each of them. I know that some of these aren't actually evolutionary theories, they're more creation theories, but it all falls in line to how we as human beings got here, to where we are now, so I'm gonna go ahead and include it in. 
But of course, if there are other evolutionary theories out there that I haven't mentioned here, definitely let me know in the comments down below because I'm sure that I'm only covering a small portion of what other stuff there is out there. But I saved the best for last because this last one is the most interesting one in my opinion, which is the idea that was suggested back in the medieval Islamic days. This idea was suggested by Al Kazini. I think that's what his name is. I could totally be wrong about that. I apologize in advance. An Iranian astronomer who saw evolutionary theory as a sort of alchemical process. Saying that just like how lead becomes tin, which then becomes brass, and that would become silver, and continue down the line until it reaches to gold, our evolutionary history worked the same way. That humans would descend from apes, who would then descend from horses. Why horses? I don't really know. I guess maybe because it was probably considered the highest form of non-human animals? At least that's what it says on the Google document. I don't know about you guys, but it seems like a whole lot of horses shit to me. <laughs> I am so painfully unfunny. A biogenic oil. This is the hypothesis that oil actually has abiotic origins instead of the common belief that they come from organic matter. Apparently, the idea goes that a compound generally found in natural gases and oil called hydrocarbon is produced from deep primitive carbon deposits within the athenosphere, which is the layer of the earth right below the lithosphere. Or it's sometimes said that they come from the deep biosphere which is a community of microorganisms within the deep sea floors that feed on hydrocarbons. Because of the discovery of these deposits, it's thought that maybe hydrocarbons can possibly be formed from the Earth's mantle abiotically, but this idea is generally disregarded by most scientists. William Denton William Denton was a geologist from England that used rather unconventional methods in learning to understand fossils, minerals, and other rock material. Instead of using traditional methods of the time, he was known to apply psychometry to his work, which is the ability to learn information about inanimate objects by simply touching them. Apparently, Denton's sister initially had this ability as she was able to give descriptive details about people by simply touching the letters they wrote. And I guess Denton himself just adopted this ability? There's not much information on this in general, so how he obtained this ability is up in the air. He would go on to give out long and detailed descriptions of certain fragmented material that he found, even claiming that he witnessed Earth in its earliest stage. In one of the several books he's written, he wrote, from the first dawn of light upon this infant globe, when round its cradles the stormy curtains hung, nature has been photographing every moment. What a picture gallery is hers. Denton would go on to make several books about his quote-unquote finds that he quote-unquote made. This obviously brings up the overall credibility of the field of psychometry, which isn't very accepted in the science community. Along with having no real way to prove its existence, it's also just more in line with something like spiritualism. Like a lot of the things here, it's an interesting idea, but no one takes it very seriously in terms of science. Carboniferous Lost World in Deep Sea in 1868, mud samples from the seafloors of the Atlantic Ocean were studied by Thomas Henry Huxley, who found what he described to be lumps of a transparent gelatinous substance that he concluded to be some kind of primordial organic slime. It would be discoveries like that that would lead to theories that maybe deep ocean life evolved much slower due to certain environmental conditions. And this area of the ocean housed certain prehistoric life that could date all the way back to the Carboniferous and maybe even Cambrian period. Excited, Huxley would name the organism Bathybius hackali, after his friend Ernst Hackel, which I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, who applauded Huxley for the find as he considered it to be an important part of the class of unicellular organisms called the Monera, which is a class that Hackel would be the first to propose as a phylum. However, in 1875, only seven years after the discovery of the Bathybius, it would be discovered that the prehistoric slime was actually nothing more than an inorganic substance, more specifically a precipitate of calcium sulfite. 
Embarrassed, Huxley would correct himself, realizing that he got too excited and made a mistake. Not only does this mean his primordial slime is not a living organism, but it also throws away the idea of a lost world in the deep seas of the oceans. But that concept would get disproven either way as our understanding of the deep ocean would get better and better as the years went on. It's not impossible that some life forms within the deep seas are descended from prehistoric life, but they surely evolved in the same rate as other organisms from other ecosystems. Hector's Ichthyosaur Hector's ichthyosaur is referring to an unidentified genus of large ichthyosaur that was discovered in 1874 by Richard Lidecker, an English naturalist and geologist. He named the specimen after Sir James Hector, another naturalist and geologist who was from New Zealand. What makes this creature unique is that, supposedly, a vertebrate belonging to Hector's ichthyosaur was discovered and said to have been around 45 centimeters, or nearly 18 inches. And if these numbers held true, then that means this unidentified ichthyosaur would be larger than the Shastasaurus, which is not only the largest ichthyosaur discovered so far, but is said to be the largest marine reptile to ever exist, reaching lengths from 20 to 69 feet long. And if Hector's ichthyosaur was larger than Shastasaurus by double those numbers, it could potentially be the largest animal in the world, even exceeding lengths past today's largest animal, the blue whale. Unfortunately, we'll never truly know if this was the case because apparently the ship that was transporting the fossil remains of Hector's ichthyosaur, which was said to be some vertebrates and some jaw fragments, would become shipwrecked off the coast of New Zealand, meaning the only discovered remains of this creature is likely lost forever. Information about this entry is pretty scarce, so I can't tell you with certainty that the events played out exactly like this, but it's also said that even though the remains are lost and nobody knows the true size of the ichthyosaur, scientists have guessed it to be over double the size of Shastasaurus and look similar to it in appearance. Beebe's Tetrapteryx William Beebe was an American naturalist, entomologist, explorer, and even ornithologist. In fact, he had a fascination with the evolution of birds, and sometime in the early 1900s even theorized that birds originated from a hypothetical Tetrapteryx, a speculated four-wing avian ancestor that was more so represented as a possible stage of bird evolution when they possessed two extra wings from their hind legs. The reason for this was because he guessed that fossils of archaeology and maybe even modern baby birds possess some evidence of feathering on the proximal hind limbs, leading Bibi to wonder if these were maybe remnants of larger feathers that their ancestors had on their legs, giving them extra wings that would have been helpful for gliding from tree to tree. But Gerhard Heilmann, a Danish paleontologist, would study both the Archaeopteryx fossils and modern baby birds, to which he was met with no traces or evidence of what he referred to as pelvic wings. As a result, the theory was rejected for a while, but with the discovery of bird-like dinosaurs like Microraptor and several others made in much more recent times, it means that BB's theory did hold some weight after all and is taken more seriously. However, it doesn't completely tie every loose end. It's still unknown if Archaeopteryx really did have long feathers on its hind limbs that could have served as extra wings, but according to Nick Longrich, a doctoral student at the University of Calgary in Canada, who he examined several Archaeopteryx specimens in the early 2000s, he speculated that hind wings could have had a lot of good uses for the Archaeopteryx given they possessed them. The hind wings could have helped Archaeopteryx control its flight better, or possibly serve as air brakes like modern pigeons, or just help it maneuver more effectively for it to pursue prey, and so on. Overall, Bibi's Tetrapteryx is quite a concept that some may say was ahead of its time if you really think about it. Burringer Stones Johann Bartholomew Adam Burringer was a German physician and professor of medicine who was a doctor at the Würzburg Julius Hospital. He would eventually develop an interest in natural history and would expand his career into that area of science. This was enough for him to want to set up his own expeditions where he would send out his assistants to go find fossil materials for him to study. While his interest and devotion to these different fields may seem admirable to some, others didn't think so. In fact, in 1725, J. Ignace Rodrique and Johann George von Eckhart, a professor in geography and algebra and a university librarian, saw Beringer as arrogant and sought out to prank him. 
You know, just an innocent prank, nothing much. Maybe put his hand in a warm bowl of water while he sleeps, or replace all of his sugar with salt, or make him believe that he discovered several hundred genuine stone carvings that would actually be the very thing that ruined his reputation. You know, nothing but innocent pranks over here. But yeah, that unfortunately happened. Along with Rodrique and Eckhart, one of Burringer's assistants was in on the prank as well, and would actually be the one to place the fake stones all throughout the mountain that he and two others were sent off to find fossilized or dated materials in. During the initial trip, the three assistants discovered three of these fake stone carvings, which very much excited Burringer. The stones themselves were carved to have different shapes and imagery on them, some depicting stars, the sun, and the moon, others depicting various animals, bugs, and other types of organisms. Burringer would develop multiple hypotheses to explain their existence, like they were created by God or some kind of divine power, or maybe they were even created by pagans. He planned to publish his writings into a book and at that point Rodrique and Eckhart had apparently felt the joke had been taken far enough, and even tried to tell Burringer part of the truth that the stones were actually fake. However, Burringer saw this as them trying to keep him from publishing his quote unquote discoveries and didn't listen to them. Unfortunately, he would make his book and get it printed, but soon after that happened, Burringer would come to the realization that he had been pranked. Understandably upset about all of this, he took Rodrique and Eckhart to court, where he would more than win the case. Rodrique and Eckhart were stripped of their titles from the university, and Rodrique would actually be exiled from Würzburg. Despite this, the damage to Burringer's reputation had already been done. And though he spent a lot of time trying to recover what he had left of it, it would never be the same again. But before you decide to be sad for Burringer for this whole ordeal, a paper written in 2005 gives off a different interpretation of that ordeal that had taken place all those years ago. Apparently, Burringer had been making these discoveries of fake stones during the summer of 1725, during which Rodrique was out of town. Along with this, Rodrique wouldn't even become a professor at the University of Würzburg until December of that same year. What's being implied here is that it's possible Burringer may have planted the fake stones himself. They do talk about the other people associated with this prank, but again, it's mainly trying to imply that Burringer was maybe responsible for it. Of course, nothing is really proven, especially since these events took place almost a few hundred years ago. But what do you guys think? Fossil record highly incomplete. This is referring to the general fact that the fossil record is incomplete and provides limited materials, which presents one of several obstacles that paleontologists will always have to work around. Everything that has already been discovered by paleontologists today is really only a fraction of what there is or what there once was. There are a number of reasons for why this is, some of which are maybe because these remains are in difficult places that scientists will never be able to retrieve them from, some of them were probably destroyed from either natural or unnatural causes, some have become lost to time, maybe even stolen, or simply because they haven't been discovered yet. Atlantean Mammoth Bones so this specific idea comes from a book called Did Spaceman Colonize the Earth, which was written by Robin Collins and published in 1974. There's not a whole lot of information on the book itself, let alone one of the ideas it posits. There have been many cases of fossil fragments and remains of mammoths and mastodons turning up from the Atlantic continental shelf, which may not come as a surprise to some who are aware that back during the Ice Age, sea levels were a lot lower and exposed several more miles of land. However, However, Collins interprets these discoveries in a completely different way. He sees these oceanic mammoth discoveries to be from the lost continent of Atlantis, where he mentions the Atlanteans had managed to domesticate them. He also says that both the Atlanteans and the mammoths were created by extraterrestrial forces. Again, there's not a whole lot of information about this book or its contents around the internet, but I'm sure those who have their own copies can fill us in on the rest of the details in the comments below. If not, the book itself seems to be easily accessible, so maybe I can just get my hands on it myself and give you guys an updated version of this entry when I get around to updating the series. We'll see. Bon Stegosaurus 
This is referring to Frank Bond's Stegosaurus paleo art, which depicts a very outdated look on the well-known dinosaur. Instead of upright plates on its back, they are replaced by pairs of curved spikes. The animal itself has a very wide body, it may be semi-bipedal, and it seems to have some kind of armor plating on its back that's similar to that of a pangolin or armadillo. Again, it's outdated, but a very great example of retro paleo art. Eozoan Canadense if I remember correctly, I believe I already made mention of this earlier in the iceberg when I was talking about pseudofossils. That's exactly what Eozoan canadense is, a piece of rock that looks like a fossilized remain of a once living organism, but was actually made from calcite and serpentine that goes through a physical and chemical process to look the way it does. This was first discovered in 1858 by John William Dawson. Even then, people were skeptical of whether or not this fossil had originated from biotic origins, and this would result in an almost 50 year dispute where it would be concluded that it was inorganic all along. Man, imagine spending 50 years trying to prove that a rock is a rock. I'm totally just kidding, but when you put it that way, it kind of makes the whole situation just a little bit funnier. Spinal Catastrophism Spinal catastrophism refers to the seemingly obsolete theory that all organism spines represent a catalog of their evolutionary history through prehistoric catastrophes like mass extinctions. There's a 2019 book titled Spinal Catastrophism, written by Thomas Moynihan, which takes a closer look at the history of the theory itself, but its synopsis probably explains it the best. If human morphology, upright posture, and the possibility of language are the ramified accidents of natural history, then psychic ailments are ultimately afflictions of the spine, which itself is a scale model of biogenetic trauma, a portable map of the catastrophic events that shaped the atrocity exhibition of evolutionary traumata, the sick orthograde talking mammal, tracing its provenance through the biological notions of phylogeny and organic memory that fueled its early psychoanalysis back into idealism, nature philosophy, and romanticism, and across multi-form encounters between philosophy, psychology, biology, and geology, Thomas Moynihan reveals the historical continuity of spinal catastrophism. Whether this book succeeds in anything to prove this theory to be correct, I can't really say. But it may be another thing I might pick up for myself because this is definitely an interesting theory. I could be wrong with how I'm interpreting this theory from what I've researched about it, and correct me if I am, but the gist that I'm getting from this is that this is kind of like the dragons are genetic memories of dinosaurs concept. But instead of us absorbing the memories of our ancestors genetically passed through millions of years of evolution, we are essentially absorbing the physical spinal pain and trauma that our ancestors had to experience through these different catastrophes that have somehow been genetically passed through millions of years of evolution. Again, I could totally be misinterpreting this because this is one of those confusing entries, but the general idea is that our spines are supposed to represent a sort of map of catastrophic events that have led up to our moment in time today. It should also be noted that the Google document for this iceberg seems to have a slightly different take on this, where basically each vertebrate is associated with a specific point in time and those time periods are split up by mass extinctions. It's possible the creator of this iceberg actually read the book, which probably states this in more detail, so I thought it was worth mentioning, but I don't know for sure. Big Paleo Big Paleo is the name given to the general sphere of paleontology that's often used by the more conspiracy-heavy side of groups like creationists and Christians against dinosaurs. I could be wrong, but I kind of want to say that Big Paleo might be parodying the Big Brother nickname that's given to the government, which is a term that's used by a lot of skeptics and conspiracy theorists, but is also just a general nickname for it as well. Obviously, creationists and Christians against dinosaurs are skeptical of paleontology, or certain areas of paleontology. For example, the idea that scientists are withholding fossil evidence that could potentially prove the possibility of the young earth idea or the existence of certain organisms, otherwise known as Smithsonian suppression, something that we actually already covered here on the iceberg. And while we're on the topic of creationists, there is something that I want to say real quick. To the creationists that keep commenting on my videos, I just want to say that I think I'm ready. I think I am ready 
to finally embrace the truth. The more things that I cover on this iceberg or read about paleontology, the more I realize how bullshit some of these ideas are. So I feel that I am finally ready to ditch the lies that have been spread by these so-called scientists and paleontologists and I'm just kidding evolution rules. Tetraprothomo. In the early 19th century, Czech anthropologist Ales Hardlička traveled to Argentina where he met Florentino Ameghino, an Argentine naturalist who was responsible for the discovery of several species of man, some of which lived during the time of Homo sapiens while others served as precursors to the human race. One of these precursors was Tetraprothomo. Prothomo, which apparently translates to the first, and in this case it's specifically referring to species of humans. So when this is applied to Tetraprothomo, it's saying that this species is four steps before Homo or humans. People like Amagino used the remains to posit and support the idea that humanity began in South America. But the idea was met with ridicule and criticism. The rebuttal for this was the accepted belief that evolution in or near the southern hemisphere was much slower than in the northern hemisphere. As a result, it was believed that evolution could only really take place in the northern hemisphere. But it was also due to the confirmation that the species that Amagino found were dated to be much more recent than what he initially thought, making it impossible for them to be old enough to be the oldest examples of humans. Animal Archetypes this is referring to Sir Richard Owen's archetype idea that he brought up in his book titled On the Nature of Limbs, which the idea of is considered one of his most notable accomplishments. An archetype is essentially a blueprint or starting point for certain groups of organisms whose features are built upon or based on that very starting point. For example, to explain common ancestry among living creatures, Owen's provided a theoretical framework to compare the various similarities between organisms. He specifically compared the human hand, a bat's wing, a whale's flipper, and a horse's hoof to each other, noting that while each of them have different uses and look different from one another, they all possess the same basic design. But I kind of lied, because what Owens was trying to prove with the use of archetypes was that all of these different organisms did not necessarily share a similar ancestor, but rather the same transcendental form. There was an effort in creating a framework that could connect both function and form, but Owens always preferred the latter. Neo-Geocentrism Geocentrism is the idea that Earth is at the center of our solar system and the Sun and all of the other planets orbit around us. This is shown off in the Ptolemaic model made by, you guessed it, Ptolemy in 150 CE. But in 1543 this model would be replaced by the Copernican model made by Nicholas Copernicus, who put the sun at the center of the universe completely stationary as the planets, including our own, orbit around it. Neo-geocentrism refers specifically to modern geocentrism, as there are still plenty of people who apparently believe everything orbits around our planet. According to a 2012 survey by the National Science Foundation, 26% of 2200 Americans still believe the sun orbits around the Earth. And the numbers are even worse in Europe as about 34% of people also said the sun orbits around the Earth. 30% of people in India said the same thing, 28% in Malaysia, and 14% in South Korea. Of course, the dates for these other results vary, so these numbers might be outdated by now. Regardless, these numbers are seen as surprisingly high for a topic like this. Nibiru killed the dinosaurs. Nibiru, or Planet X as it's sometimes referred to, is a hypothetical planet that's said to orbit around the outskirts of our solar system, so far out that making a full rotation around the sun could take millions of years. In 1985, astrophysicist Daniel Whitmire suggested that this planet actually causes mass extinctions on Earth every 27 million years including the one that killed off the dinosaurs. He expands on the idea by explaining this hypothetical planet makes its rotation around the sun roughly every 27 million years, and during that rotation it passes through a large asteroid belt known as the Kuiper Belt, where its gravitational pull knocks space debris and comets out of their orbital routes, and deeper into the solar system where they fly straight towards Earth. Even recent studies have supported the idea that previous mass extinctions had not only occurred in regular intervals that have been estimated to be around 26 or 27 million years, but also that they have mainly been caused by comets striking directly into Earth. Aristotelian Petrification Fluid 
One of the earliest fossil theories came from Aristotle himself, who suggested that fossils had become stone through means of vaporous exhalations. This was later revisited by Avicenna, a Persian astronomer, physician, and philosopher who wrote an encyclopedia in the early 11th century called the Book of Healing. In that book, he goes through many areas of science like astronomy, chemistry, psychology, and even paleontology. In this segment, Avicenna reiterates Aristotle's theory on how fossils obtained their stoniness, and then modifies the idea by suggesting that petrification fluid was responsible for transforming organic material into stone. This fluid was even given a name called Sucus Lepidificatus. Correct me if I mispronounce that. Anyways, this theory would continue to be reiterated and commonly accepted amongst naturalists all the way to the 16th century. Now, our understanding of fossils is much better, and we now know they are formed through the sedimentary buildup and the crystallization of dissolved minerals washed up in the tiny spaces within the bones. So, the idea of petrification fluid is considered outdated. Francevillian biota. The Francevillian biota, also known as the Gabin iota, is referring to a group of multicellular macroscopic organisms dated to be 2.1 billion years old, and lived all the way back in the Paleoproterozoic era. While not categorized under a formal taxon yet, and many people having different ideas as to what these organisms could actually be, others see their fossils as possible evidence that these may very well be the oldest multicellular life ever discovered. What's even more strange is that for a while, they'd be the only organisms to form on Earth as the next organisms wouldn't show up until the Ediacaran biota about 1.5 billion years later. With all of this into consideration, the find would lead to discussion and debates on their origins and what they actually were. Unfortunately, they aren't the most well understood finds and their appearances vary from each other. Some were flat and round, some were misshapen and long, and others are described as microbial mats. Regardless of this, one scientist did bring up the possibility that maybe they weren't even organized organisms at all, but rather pseudofossils or material that represented inorganic life. Despite this, for the most part, it seems the Francevillian biota are treated as actual organisms. Jack Horner Grooming Scandal Wait, you're telling me Jack Horner was involved in a grooming scandal? I didn't know he was a Minecraft YouTuber. Okay, listen, sustained disgust. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Like, I I'm trying really hard to defend your iceberg. I've been telling people that paleontology fringe theories is just a general title for the whole iceberg and everything else is at least somewhat related or adjacent to it. But now even I'm confused as to why this shit is on here. Obviously because it involves Jack Horner, but still, it's probably the most out of place entry out of everything here. But for the sake of completing the iceberg to its fullest, I shall talk about it. The scandal this entry is referring to is Jack Horner's relationship with his then-intern, 19-year-old Vanessa Weaver, back in 2011. At the time, the two had worked at Montana's Museum of the Rockies, where Horner had been the curator for about 34 years at that time. But in 2012, he was let go from the museum after marrying the undergraduate student. And aside from the obviously huge age gap between the two, which is about 46 years, the idea that Horner, who was a professor at that time, was having this kind of relationship with his undergraduate student is considered to be extremely unprofessional. So he was forced out of his job as a result of it. And in the end, the two would apparently end up getting a divorce, so that all seemed kind of pointless. All right, that's a good place to stop. Enough paleo internet for me today, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of tier three. This was definitely the most interesting one so far. And aside from the weird Jack Horner entry at the end there, I think this was my favorite episode to work on so far. Of course, things are only going to get more weird and fringe as we continue down the iceberg. As always, thank you guys so much for your patience. It really means a lot, especially since these videos take me a very long time to make. Hopefully you won't have to wait too much much longer for part two of tier three, but we'll see. I have a few other projects planned out to release soon that I'm pretty sure you guys will love as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. Until then, if you haven't checked out my other recent videos, you can find their links in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching and please have a nice day.